Welcome to the second session of the day. Um, Dr. David Fahad, Dr. Hassan Asaf, and myself will be moderating the session. Um, we are privileged to have distinguished uh, speakers among us today. Uh, each one will be giving one or two talks for about uh, 15 minutes uh, each. I would urge the speaker for the interest of time to stick to the time. At the same time, I would urge the audience to send by SMS their question. Don't wait till the end. Send the question and then at the very end we have 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, the first session of the first talk for, for today is by um, a rock star in ophthalmology. Uh, his name is Dr. Dr. Skog, and he doesn't need any introduction, but for the interest of formality, I would have to say he's a professor in uh, ophthalmology from uh, Baylor Medical Center. He has contributed tremendously to our knowledge in intraocular lens calculation and Korean power uh, calculation. He has initiated the ASPUS uh, website, the ASPUS uh, IOL formula website. He recently uh, gave us a huge uh, paradigm shift in calculating uh, toric IOLs by um, showing the importance of the posterior corneal curvature and the total corneal power. He's given all of those Kelman lecture, big course, and all the lectures you see, the honorary lecture you see in, in uh, major meetings. Dr. Koch, please welcome me to uh, uh, welcome me to uh, for Dr. Koch. Thank you very much. What a pleasure to be here. Um, I've been here for two days now. Your country is incredible. The people, the food, the things to see, the tradition, it's really fabulous. Um, so I'm going to talk to you in two talks about intraocular lens calculations. And the first one is going to focus more just on the cornea, and then the second talk will cover some other topics as well. So I'm going to give you four cases that illustrate problems with corneal measurements and intraocular lens calculations. This is a normal case. Uh, the refractive target was minus 1.5. Uh, this is the lens star reading, 4471. This is the Galilei, 4439. With the Holiday 1 formula, the prediction was minus 1.4. And with the Galilei using the same formula, minus 1.18. The patient ended up um, minus 0.87. So the error was a, a little over a half diopter with a biometer. So when I have an error over a half diopter, I'd like to look at it again and, and try to determine what the problem was. And uh, in so doing, uh, look at the new readings. The, uh, the lens star is almost 0.7 diopters flatter, but the Galilei is almost 0.3 diopters steeper. And this is what we see every day in our practices, isn't it? So how do we measure the anterior corneal surface? We do it with a, a variety of technologies, include that one of the ways or overall categories is reflection. Of course, the, the most classic example is the keratometer. But now with our auto keratometers in our biometers, they use LEDs that are reflected off the corneal surface. Um, and then we also can use uh, Placido devices, such as this is an atlas image. And the advantage of Placido is you can actually look at the Myers, you can look at the reflections of the rings, and it tells you if the raw data that you're, you're examining are, are good. And in this case, you can see that there's distortion here in this patient had Salzman's nodular degeneration that needed to be treated first. Uh, there's another way to do use reflection now, and that uh, is this device called the Cassini, which has color LEDs reflected off the anterior corneal surface. It's a very interesting device. Well, I like Placido Myers because I can look at them and I can, can screen for conditions such as epithelial basement membrane disease, Salzman's, anything that might impair the vision or alter or impair the accuracy of the IOL calculations. And I find it just really a great dry eye screen because if the patient can keep his or her eye open long enough to get a good reading, I know that the, the eye is not overly dry at least. Now we can also use elevation-based systems to measure corneal power. Scheinflug systems such as the Pentacam or the Galilei. Um, and uh, OCT technology is being used more and more now to measure not only the anterior cornea but as I will talk about the posterior cornea. 
but we really don't do as well as we think we do. These are measurements of a group of patients taken one week and then one week later. So same eye, same patient taken one week later. This is the first device that was done and you can see that the cluster, these are the differences in the measurements, that's fairly tight. Um, but the, uh, the, this, if this is a standard deviation, two standard deviations is 0.3 diopters either way, that's 0.6. And this device, there's a lot more scattered. This happens to be the Iowa Master 500. This happens to be the Lensstar. So our devices, the newer devices are getting better, but every one is subject to error. So here's a patient of mine who came in for surgery. The K reading is 43.34. Astigmatism, two diopters. So everybody's thinking toric IOL, get ready to make the correction. But I also got an IOL Master 700 and couldn't get any K readings from it. And uh, it would not give me K readings. And all of a sudden I look down here and there's one of the points is missing. So it turns out this patient had come to see me three months before, so I pulled out the Galilei measurement from before and the Galilei reading was 44.6 as opposed to the 43.34 I got with a lens star. And the astigmatism was a tenth of a diopter, not 2.05. So I have two completely different readings. Well, I checked his ocular surface. And uh, by the way, these are the lens star measurements. And look at the distortion. Same zone, every one of these, as we saw with the IOL Master 700. So I treated the ocular surface and repeated the studies six days later and now you can see that the rings are restored and that lower quadrant is doing, looks good. The patient received a uh, extended depth of focus, the Symphony Lens 2020 and J2. So the lesson is we do need to take more than one measurement on our patients to validate what we are you know, using for our, our calculations. And you need to look at the raw data to verify that the numbers you're putting in to your formulas are accurate. And you can evaluate it on a qualitative basis by looking at the reflections of the Myers. These look great. This looks terrible. Or you can use numerical ones. I think Warren Hill was here last year, and he shared with us his acceptable values for the lens star with a standard deviation for the K readings of 0.3 diopters and um, for angle uh, point, uh, 3.5 degrees. So why is the variability obviously has to do with the tear film, with dry eye, with corneal pathology, with the technician, uh, is the technician taking the measurement in an efficient manner? The devices used really are not the problem. The devices we have now are great. It's really uh, all the other factors. Well, what about the posterior cornea? This is a patient. You can see the K, the K reading 41, and these are various uh, radius of curvature measurements uh, taken with a Galilei with a ratio of 0.85. Um, the Holiday 1 predicted minus 0.1, the Bar Barrett predicted about the same, and the patient ended off only a quarter diopter off, which is very close. We're all happy with that. Um, but it is interesting if you look at that 0.85 because we looked at the average population First of all, we know that when we say corneal power is, for example, 43, it's really 49 on the front and minus 6 on the back. And the minus 6 is, of course, uh, a guess because the way we measure or take into account the posterior cornea is by extrapolating. We don't measure it at all. We measure the anterior cornea in some selected small zone and then we extrapolate posterior corneal curvature using a ratio from the front to the back that is based on a population average. Not everybody is normal, right? Everybody, there's a lot of variability. So what ratio should we use? Well, the normal ratio we have found in 94 patients is point, around 0.82, which was previously published many years ago. Um, if you look at myopic LASIK, the ratio is lower, and if you look at hyperopic LASIK, the ratio is higher. So we're changing all the relationships with all of our, uh, our various uh, interventions in the cornea. And our patient had a flat cornea and a high ratio. It had we used, uh, the, the expected ratio would have given us 41.46, but the actual ratio in this patient was, four, was 0.85, and so it was 41.74, and that explains the error. Now that's a quarter diopter, that's nothing to worry about. 
And in most of our normal patients, it doesn't really matter. It, but there is going to be an occasional surprise that can be as high as a half diopter. But of course, where this becomes important are in all of the unusual corneas. Um, corneal surgery, whether it's refractive corneal surgery or keratoplasty, and in patients with ectasia. And certainly in, in trying to select toric eye wells, which I will talk about in my next talk. So can we really measure the posterior cornea accurately? We have all these devices. We have shine fluke devices. We have OCT devices that are now looking into this. Uh, these are all the new swept source OCT biometers. And what they do is they measure the anterior cornea with the LEDs. They measure the corneal thickness with a swept source OCT. So they add the anterior corneal power to the posterior corneal thickness to get the posterior corneal curvature and then they can calculate total corneal power. The problem is anytime you use elevation measurements to calculate corneal power, they're not as accurate. Um, this slide from Cynthia Roberts shows that if you want to compare a 45 versus a 45.25 diopter sphere, the difference in height at a 3 millimeter zone is 0.9 microns. And that's actually below the accuracy of the devices. So it's, it's hard to be super accurate with, with uh, elevation-based measurements. There is another technology uh, for uh, now for looking at the posterior cornea, and that's using reflection. These are the, this is the image off the Cassini, and you can see the color LEDs. They're measuring anterior corneal curvature, and then you can see these seven spots. Well, these seven spots there are reflecting off the anterior cornea. But the white LEDs, those seven white LEDs, can be detected on the posterior cornea, and then they can use ray tracing to calculate corneal curvature. And uh, so I'll tell you, I'll say a little bit more about that in the next talk. Well, why is the posterior, cor posterior cornea so hard to measure? It's hard to measure because there's so little difference in refractive index between the cornea and the aqueous. So it's a very tough surface to find optically and to uh, quantify and we don't have a gold standard. When we do a measurement with a machine, we really don't know whether it's right or not. Uh, here's a post-LASIK eye. Uh, this patient, obviously, very flat case after LASIK surgery. These are all the different formulas on the ASCARIS website. Uh, with the high gazelle predicting plus 0.35, the Barrett minus 1.5, that's the biggest range. The OCT is minus 1.39. Uh, aberometry, minus 0.31. So what the heck do you pick? Well, anyway, I put in um, a lens. Uh, the, with the lens that I put in, the patient ended up minus two. So none of them were accurate. And we all encounter that in our post-LASIK patients. Um, and the challenges are, I think, I, I, I think it's important to understand that the anterior cornea is also a big problem in our post-LASIK patients because of variability. And then the posterior corneal measurement you can't look, measure the front and, and assume what the posterior curvature is. So how do we do these calculations now? We use these regression solutions that are based on averages, and that's what you have, uh, many of you may use this, uh, this website that we put up. And if we look at the accuracy of the various formulas, those that rely on the change in refraction from the LASIK, or those which we, I, I see more and more where patients have no prior data, they don't even know the name of the surgeon, who did uh, the LASIK surgery, and we're only getting 65% within plus or minus a half. Terrible, really very poor results. So these regression type approaches really have, we, we've really hit a ceiling, and we need to be able to measure. And if you look at the formulas on the website that involve direct measurement of the posterior cornea, we have the Galilei, we have the Pentacam, and we have the RTView OCT, and the best of these is the RTView OCT, but look, only 68% plus or minus a half diopter. Better than the Barrett, um, the High Gazelle, um, and uh, only 92% within a half diopter. Very frustrating. And uh, that's kind of re really repeating. So intraoperative measurement does seem to help. The Aura, we thought we were going to have another device. The Holos, I don't know if it's going to be bought. The company is now bankrupt. And if you look at the literature, uh, Yanchilev reported 67% plus or minus a half. Nicole Fram and Sam Maskett reported 74% plus or minus a half. Still, only three quarters of our patients plus or minus a half diopter. 
And I don't think, I think these data also show you don't need to have to have aberometry to do the best kinds of calculations in these post lazy guys. And if you have radial keratotomy, I'm not sure if much was done here in Lebanon, these results are horrible. 34% plus or minus a half, and uh, really a, a terrible operation, as it turns out. The final case is keratoconus, this patient, highly myopic with astigmatism, uh, steep Ks on the front. Um, the prediction was minus one, and the patient ended up plus one with an error of 2.21. And again, keratoconus shares with LASIK the irregularity on the front. Uh, that makes it a very daunting calculation to do, and then it's hard to know what the posterior curvature is without directly measuring it. And we've looked at the, the error. This is the prediction error, and this, the higher it is, this is the hyperopic. And the steeper the cornea, the more hyperopic these patients are after IOL surgery with the normal IOL formulas. Um, and, uh, the, and actually, that's also true for the posterior cornea that the steeper the posterior cornea, the, the greater the hyperopic error. In corneal transplantation, PKP, DSEC are, are pose similar problems. DMEC is a little more promising. So with all these complex corneas, we can't use our usual assumptions. assumptions. We really need good anterior and posterior measurements. And uh, with that, I'll stop and uh, I'll continue in a little bit for the next part. Thank you very much. Scientific Committee for inviting me to come and speak to you all. It's been a pleasure uh, to be in uh, Lebanon uh, for the first time. So I want to share with you some of the work that I've been um, working with some optical physicists for the past nine years or so and talking to you about uh, Brion microscopy and the evaluation of corneal biomechanics. Uh, none of the um, disclosures I have here are relevant to today's subject matter. And <clears throat> again, biomechanics has kind of been a hot topic. Why should we study it? We know it's important for understanding um, interocular pressure for different hectatic uh, disorders as well as those corneas that might be at risk. Uh, in addition, um, successful corneal treatments such as um, corneal cross-linking really depend on biologic biological and biomechanical tissue factors uh, for its effectiveness. If we just briefly think about the uh, corneal structure we <clears throat> and review it, the anterior one-third of the cornea actually has an isotropic arrangement. It means it has a kind of crossing uh, collagen fibrils, which really play a vital role in biomechanics and maintenance of corneal curvature, while the posterior two-thirds of the cornea have a more orthogonal arrangement, which are important um, uh, to distribute strain in the cornea and withstand the pull of the extraocular muscles. You can see an image here from an IVOS article several years ago showing that isotropic arrangement. Um, how are we measuring uh, biomechanical properties? Well, currently there are several um, kind of in vivo non-destructive devices such as the Aura and Corvus ST, which have been uh, used to evaluate um, biomechanical properties. The problem with these devices is that they um, do require a non-physiologic deformation of the cornea. And um, there have been many reports of these uh, application of these devices to be uh, quite variable. Uh, the main limitations of these devices is that they really are only evaluating uh, properties in the central three millimeters of the um, cornea and really don't represent the peripheral structure of the cornea, which can be quite relevant in ectatic disorders of the cornea. Uh, in addition, they lack the capability to capture regional differences uh, in the cornea as well. 
So as I mentioned before, I've been working um, with a group of um, op optical physicists to develop a device called brand microscopy. It's a non-contact uh, technique capable of recording and imaging the elastic modulus of the cornea and the lens in high resolution, and it does not require deformation of the cornea. Um, there's currently no way to in vivo uh, measure the intrinsic physiologic properties of the cornea, either tomographically or regionally. This is um, very interesting technology. So you may say, what is uh, Brion microscopy is based on the principle of Brion scattering. This is a form of, um, a quant it's a quantum measurement of frequency shift. Um, we are mostly familiar with uh, Rayleigh scattering, which is why the sky is blue, and me scattering, which is why clouds are white. But this is uh, Brion scattering, and basically it's a form of inelastic uh, scattering of uh, electromagnetic radiation. This, uh, each molecule has a particular property and the frequency shift caused by the, um, uh, the frequency shift of energy is, was, was what is referred to as the Brion uh, shift. And interestingly, this is not new technology. We have uh, data going all the way back to 1980 where we've looked at ex vivo ocular tissue uh, using Brion uh, scattering. Um, how do we measure this? We use a special spectroscopy uh, to um, capture this information. And it's basically the spectral shift uh, that you get um, from here to here uh, that's proportional to the longitudinal modulus of the tissue, of the elasticity of the tissue being evaluated. You can also measure viscosity as well. There are some challenges in, in uh, trying to acquire this information. It requires uh, a lot of um, high fast, high resolution, high extinction from the spectrophotometer. So for uh, one billion photons of laser light, you're only getting one photon of backscatter for Brion scattering. And that's a huge uh, problem uh, with um, obtaining the data. So the device is essentially a lab bench uh, uh, device that we've been using. And there is also a portable device that's been used in um, uh, Switzerland with Teo Seiler's uh, group. And this basically uses a 780 nanometer uh, laser light to generate uh, the uh, Brion um, measurements. So what does this look like? Well, essentially, uh, we get an image like this, and um, maybe a little easier to show. Uh, we've since switched the um, coloring around, So, but the, the top is basically the more stiff, represented in red, if you cross-section across the cornea. This next image might be a little easier to follow. Uh, basically, you can get these uh, images, both, both cross-sectional and on FOSS, and you can correlate this with um, like H&E section, cross-sectional staining in the cornea, as well as second harmonic imaging. But what you can see is this uh, graph here in number two, uh, where you have a kind of a peak in the uh, Brion microscopy, and then it plateaus and goes down as you go deeper into the cornea, showing that the cornea becomes less stiff as you move through the cornea. We can uh, use this data to basically measure slopes, kind of the anterior slope and posterior slope of the cornea. And from that, we can start to uh, develop um, stiffness-related parameters. So what are the possible uses for Brion uh, optical microscopy? Well, obviously, we can use this to try to detect subtle differences in the biomechanical properties of the cornea, such as evaluating um, patients for laser vision correction, uh, et cetera. So if we look at the normal population, we can start to understand how the Brion microscopy uh, kind of correlates to information we already know. Uh, if we look at the distance from the center of the pupil as we move outward, the cornea is actually less stiff in the center and gets stiffer as we move out to the periphery of the cornea. Likewise, as the cornea becomes thicker, it also becomes more stiff, and it's actually negatively correlated with curvature. So as the cornea gets more steep, the cornea actually becomes less stiff in those areas. And we can look at this uh, slope, anterior and posterior slope, and we can see in the central cornea, as I mentioned before, both, both the um, uh, uh, minimum uh, Brion shift as well as the anterior slope are much uh, less in the central part of the cornea compared to the uh, peripheral portion of the cornea. If we look at age dependence, we know the cornea becomes stiffer over time and Brion microscopy can measure these, um, these variables. So we see the cornea, get, the Brion measurements increasing uh, as, we get, uh, as we look at patients who are older. 
Um, other possible uses included uh, as an early diagnostic tool for the diagnosis of keratoconus. Um, if we look at a uh, patient, um, these are ex vivo corneas, but if we look at normal versus uh, ectatic uh, cornea, you can see the slope is much steeper here uh, than the normal kind of one slope and second slope, uh, which is um, consistent with what we know about keratoconus. And likewise, the slope and uh, modulus of the brion measurements also are consistent with that. Uh, we can look at adult specimens. We have a, from a patient with keratoconus. And what you can see here is this is the uh, uh, central uh, cornea from a, a keratoprosthesis uh, tissue that we took and then from adult uh, patient. And again, you can see here the normal, normal cornea has a much more normal uh, kind of slope one, slope two versus this uh, rapid uh, steep slope in the keratoconus cornea. And we can look at this also with the looking at the anterior brion shift and slope showing the same uh, data. What's really exciting about this device is its ability to measure things regionally. So you can look at very uh, small cross sections of the cornea as shown uh, here in this histologic uh, specimen. If you look at the area directly through the thinnest part of the cornea at the apex of the cone, uh, you'll see this uh, very steep slope here with the Brion shift. And if you look just outside the cone, it automatically increases in terms of stiffness. So what it shows is that the whole cornea is not stiff in keratoconus, you just have regional areas, and this is very consistent with um, what uh, Cynthia Roberts has said about biomechanics and where the, um, where, where the uh, force is uh, regarding uh, ectasia. And if we look at the periphery here, we get almost a very normal slope uh, for this. So you can see what's great about this is we can actually map uh, this uh, data through multiple points to actually create a map, kind of an, elastic, an elasticity map, the same way we might have a curvature map, uh, and we can correlate that with the Pentacam uh, data here, shown here, to, sh to identify those, those weak areas uh, in the cornea. So this is actually a physiologic representation as opposed to a uh, topographic um, uh, representation of the cornea. And we can look at this in different ways. This here's a some maps here in normal, maybe mild to moderate keratoconus and advanced keratoconus. These are these uh, Brion maps of these uh, areas that are outlined here in black. And you can start to see in normal, you have a kind of homogeneous pattern, again, a, a higher Brion measurement. But as you uh, move into the mild to advanced cases, uh, the Brion shift decreases, in indicating increasing uh, elasticity in those areas. Uh, and um, again, uh, down below here, you can show that in the area of the cone, the Brion shift is very low, but as soon as you move outside the cone area, it increases and almost moves into a normal um, uh, range of uh, stiffness uh, compared to the area inside the cone. And we can correlate that also with the um, stages of keratoconus. Uh, here, where more advanced stages are going to have uh, uh, more elastic corneas and also correlate this with uh, curvature, as I mentioned before. There's a negative correlation here, so the steeper the cornea is, the uh, more elastic it is. And although the sensitivity is not quite there on individual cases, uh, this is just showing uh, this uh, mild keratoconus patients compared to, let's say, normal or low normal minimum. There's still a fair amount of overlap, and we're working to increase the sensitivity of the device to help us identify those cases. Um, other uses include the assessment of outcomes, such as uh, collagen cross-linking. Um, right now, we kind of use um, OCT to look at demarcation lines to help us indicate uh, how effective it was. And I know that uh, uh, Dr. Shadi Awad here has developed some uh, very interesting software to help us uh, evaluate that. But this device can also measure the actual effect or stiffening effect of the uh, keratoconus, uh, I'm sorry, of the collagen cross-linking in vivo. And in this here, you see uh, 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 before cross-linking, after cross-linking with Brion microscopy. Again, this increasing red, we've such since switched the coloring, but is increased stiffness. And this is this line here showing uh, the increase in uh, Brion measurement consistent with increased stiffening. And we can look at, we did some studies looking at um, epi-off techniques to look at the effect of cross-linking with epi-off. And you can actually see here 
um, the uh, statistically significant uh, increase in Brion measurement for anterior and uh, mid-stromal um, cross-linking, whereas a posterior stroma had no evidence of cross-linking. So very consistent with what we have seen. And also uh, looking at epi-on uh, techniques, um, we got less effect compared to epi-off techniques. Um, again, this was uh, not with iontophoresis or any of the newer te epi-on techniques, but just showing the effectiveness of cross-linking with this epi-on technique. We can also use this to assess changes after a laser vision correction. And you can see these um, uh, uh, prion microscopy maps before and after. And you can see there is a change in elasticity before and after uh, LASIK. Uh, this is a PRK patient where it essentially stayed the same. Other uses include the use for understanding the progression of presbyopia and formation of cataracts and uh, looking at um, lens stiffness. So uh, we, we first did some animal measurements just to show that we could uh, capture the um, lens with the Brion microscopy. And you can see here that uh, this is, oh, sorry, you can see here that this is uh, the Brion uh, peak shift. And as the mi mice uh, get older, the Brion stiffness numbers go up, which indi indicate increasing stiffness. We can look at humans the same way, and you can see there's an increase in stiffness as you move from the lens cortex to the lens nucleus uh, with a peak, elastic, uh, peak uh, uh, elasticity measurement. Here, what's kind of interesting is that uh, plateau really doesn't change. It just gets much wider, and in this comparison between a 23-year-old and 45-year-old, you have about a 14% increase in total stiffness. And um, this is just showing that effect where the maximum modulus doesn't really change with age, but the overall stiffness does increase as we get older. This might be a really interesting technology to look at some things like femtosecond laser lentotomy, where people are trying to use the femtosecond laser to actually uh, improve accommodation. We could use the device to measure this or some of these new uh, drops that in theory should be able to uh, improve accommodation as well. We have a lot of studies going on, including looking at Fuchs uh, for hydration in the cornea. But um, I just wanted to uh, introduce this technology to you and just uh, emphasize that corneal biomechanics are really fundamental to understanding the diagnosis and treatment of corneal disease, that we definitely need better tools to assess these biomechanics. Uh, Brion microscopy um, can measure both viscoelastic properties of the cornea, both non-invasively and tomographically in a very different way than we've been able to look at before. And it has other many uh, potential applications and could be combined with other technology such as topography or finite element analysis. So thank you very much. And because my grandparents were born here. And we decided to invite my mother and my family to know our parents. And it was a great time because we have uh, an emotional meeting here. Thank you, Dr. Sala and Dr. Shadi for the invitation. Now, let me talk about new concept, new technique. 
This is our remodeling technique to treat the keratoconus. And let me present our results. The keratoconus is multifactorial with evidence of inflammatory imbalance and oxidative biomechanical process. It could be corrected with glasses, contact lens, intracorneal rings, cross-linking, facic IULs, and corneal transplant. Our purpose today is to introduce a new technique, a new technology to treat the keratoconus and analyze the long-term results. This technique is being developed to produce a topography change in a more predictable way. This technique is based on reducing the corneal optical aberrations and is a technique with a large optical zone than the old one used in the segments. Such so technique does not increase the corneal thickness. Let me show you how we began to do that. We began with an eczema laser using a special mask that we developed, steam steel mask and plastic mask, in order to generate a geometrical shape to block the laser and to do a keratectomy in the peripheric of the cornea. We removed, we calculated the remotion that we are doing with a tech keratectomy in each kind of keratoconus. And after that, we stitches, we put suture in the cornea, and uh, this is after surgery. But uh, what, what is the idea? What is the concept? The concept is that if we remove one portion of the cornea here, and after that, we place this, this, the suture, we go to stretch the cornea, like here. We are going to stretch the cornea. Now, for each keratoconus, we do different treatment. It depends the grade, the stage of the keratoconus. We calculate the volume that the keratoconus use to get this new stiffness cornea. Then, for example, for some keratoconus grade two, we do similar to this geometrical shape. For other, for more advanced, we do that. And in the severe keratoconus, we do more remotion, we calculate more volume, and in different way. This is a schematic representation. When we remove the cornea in the peripherica, we have a new radio, and we reduce the internal chamber. Then we are correcting the keratoconus in two ways. We are giving a new radio, we flat the cornea, and we reduce the anterior chamber. This is the new anterior chamber. Today, two years ago, we began to work with a femtosecond laser because for each keratoconus, we need to do a different shape. And with the eczema laser, we, we couldn't do that because we, we will need a lot of mask to do that. Then we decided to introduce this uh, technology in the femtosecond laser. We are working with a similar house. It's a Switzerland company. But uh, the idea is to implant, uh, implement this software in all the machine in the femtosecond laser. This is the volume that we calculated to remove in this. This is the bubble of the laser. This is the bubble, the cornea is the limbus is here. And you can see how we remove this portion. This keratoconus, we remove this of the eye. And this is the reason that keratoconus cannot go back. We correct it. We can to have another progression, but not, never will have the same keratoconus that you had in the past. And uh, for severe keratoconus, we, we were not uh, planning to do that in severe keratoconus because, uh, you know, this is for corneal transplant. But in some cases, we decide to do before that the corneal transplant. And our surprise has been that they don't need trans corneal transplant. Then we are doing to this technology to for advanced keratoconus. In these cases, of course, we have to remove more tissues because the cornea is in bad condition. This volume of the cornea that we remove, we calculate like you calculate the intraoperal length. When you calculate the intraoperal length, you know the biometry and the cornea. And here, we know the, the biometry and the length. And we calculate what is the cornea that this patient need. 
and this is the this is the way that we can create the geometric shape to do that. This is our results. We have 84 cases, three years follow up. This is the age, the distribution of female and male, and the follow up up to 40 months. This is our results. The uncorrected vision, we divide in three different groups, 180 degrees resection, 270 degrees keratectomy, and 360 degree keratectomy. The three different groups for analyze that was that the in uncorrected visual acuity increased in all the three groups. The spherical equivalent reduced in the three case groups. The best correct visual acuity increased in all of them. And the anterior chamber is well reduced in all of them. In some cases, the position of the epithelium in the post-op now is in the endothelium position because we reduce 500 micras in some cases, 400, 300, depending of the, severe, the, the stage of the keratoconus. This is the first group, the uncorrected visual acuity. You can see how the vision increased. This group, we, have, we, we did the PRK after surgery two years later, and you can see that all the cases are between 2020 and 2030 without glasses. This is the gain and loss line of vision in this group. You can see how it increased the vision. We don't lose any line of vision in any group. This is the second group. It's the same. You can see how improved the incorrect visual acuity in all the cases. But in this group, you have, we are in between 2020 and 2030 or more. This is the gain and loss line again, but you see here, any line, we, we didn't lose any line of vision and we gain in most of them. The last group, the advanced keratoconus, the severe keratoconus, is the same. You, you see, I increase the vision in all the cases, in most of them, and the visual in 20, 20, 30 or more. This group in severe keratoconus. And this is amazing slide. Look at that. Up to six lines of vision improves the vision in these cases. Let me show you the uh, higher order of aberration and color. In the three groups, in all of them, we reduce both the, 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 the higher order and the coma. The coma is the most important in keratoconus. You see how it's reduced. And this is the, uh, the keratometry change. We, we had, we flat the flattest meridian in the three groups, and we flat the steepest meridian in the three groups. What means that? We are flattening too much the flat meridian. Then, in this moment, we had hypercorrection in the flat meridian. A little hypercorrection is not too much, but we had. And we had to modify, because we have a short time to work in that, in order not to have a too much correction in the flat meridian, just the steep meridians. Some cases, some cases for show you. This is pre and post. You cannot imagine that this patient have keratoconus. And this is working in a millimeter in optical zones. It means that you have all the cornea free to treat the cornea. It's not like an ICR, like an intracornear segment that you have in the middle of the eye. Now, let me stop here and continue with another topic, and it's what to do with an eczema laser. What we are doing well, our treatment in patients with keratoconus doing ablation with eczema laser? The answer is yes or no, but when we can do and how? Let me explain that. This case, here you have four slides, the same patients. This is the pachymetry map. You see here, this is the weak point. This is the thin point. And if you, this point, you put it in the four maps, look at that. This is the uh, anterior surface, the weak point, and the steep point. This is a vertical treatment if you want to treat this patient. Athena's protocol that they recommend to do. What, is, what we are doing that, we are ablating this point with the expert. And if you do, 
Athena's protocol with a waveform guide where you are doing more ablation in this point. This is a mistake. Then, what, 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 what happened? Look here. This is the waveform guide treatment in one patient that we have done corneal remodeling. And the laser will treat this point. And this is after the corneal remodeling. If we want to do laser after the corneal lifting or corneal remodeling, we change the vector. Then the laser, if you want to treat the patient, in this case, before you will ablate here. And if you do corneal remodeling and you want to treat this patient after surgery, you will treat in the opposite way. What means that? When we change the vector, we, the, the steepest point now is the flattened point. And then you don't need to treat. You don't need, you don't need to touch here. You will ablate in the opposite way. This is another case. It, I can repeat in all the cases because it's the same. Look here, a spherical treatment for this patient, away from treatment for this patient before the, the, the coronary remodeling. But if you do coronary remodeling, the weak point is continue being here. But the treatment after that you do that, Atana's protocol, but after the coronary remodeling will be like this one. It's another case, but it's the same. This is another case. It's repeating all the cases because we change the vector. This is a beautiful case. Before the coronary remodeling, see if you treat this patient, this is the ablation that you have to do. But if you do coronary remodeling to this patient after surgery, you will have you, you will do like this. You will ablate around, but not here, because here is the now is the flat point, it's not the steep point than before. In conclusion, this technique is a safe procedure that produces corneal flattening, reduce the depth of the anterior chamber, reduce optical operation, and offer a wide optical zone which allows to perform a complementary refractive techniques. Longer results show a slight tendency to increase the K-value due to the fact that cross-linking produces corneal stiffening. It would be expected that the association with cross linking treatment could, be, could give a greater corneal stability. Corneal remodeling represents a new and effective approach to treat keratoconus. Three years result has been presented, but longer follow-up will be necessary. Corneal remodeling allows surgeons to be able to complement target refractive correction for an integral treatment of ectasia. Shukran Jassi. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tessa, for this uh, very nice uh, presentation. Uh, now, uh, the next talk uh, with uh, Dr. Roberto Tinella, is uh, Dr. Roberto. Uh, nerve grafting for the meditation. Thank you very much. Um, I want to talk to you today a little bit about a challenging um, area that we deal with uh, in the cornea, and that's talking about the neurotrophic cornea, and share with you some of the uh, work that we've been doing uh, with the new surgical uh, technique over the past year uh, regarding this condition. Again, my disclosures, which aren't relevant here. So we all know that the corneal sensation is important for maintaining uh, clinical uh, integrity and limbal stem cell function, and that when this is compromised, uh, there is um, the cornea is uh, prone to injury and uh, decreased reflex tearing. And when uh, this, uh, when with that, there is poor healing that results in epithelial defects, ulceration, and potentially perforation. Now, uh, the neurotrophic uh, cornea is basically um, when uh, innervation to the trigeminal nerve is impaired, and it's been estimated uh, that this occurs in about uh, less than 50 and 100,000 uh, individuals. Um, the etiology of uh, neurotrophic keratitis uh, basically occurs when there's any alteration in sensory innervation from the cornea to the pontine trigeminal nucleus. 
And uh, ocular uh, conditions commonly associated with neurotrophic keratitis include herpetic uh, keratitis, but also chemical uh, radiation and um, anesthetic abuse and uh, t t drug toxicity as well as ocular uh, surgery. Um, Non-ocular conditions which uh, create neurotrophic keratitis include neurosurgical procedures such as skull-based tumor resections, intracranial masses, uh, trauma to the uh, fifth cranial nerve such as trigeminal uh, neuralgia surgery, as well as strokes, uh, leprosy, vitamin A, and various drugs. Uh, symptoms and signs, uh, are, well, most of us are familiar with this, but really most patients don't have much symptoms unless their ocular surface is infected, uh, affected where they get uh, blurred vision. Um, but the clinical uh, uh, presentation of um, neurotrophic keratitis is essentially uh, broken down into three stages by the Mackey classification. In stage one, you basically um, have hyperplasia, irregularity of the epithelium, which leads to punctate keratitis. Stage two is defined by recurrent or persistent epithelial uh, defects. And stage three is where you have stromal involvement with uh, ulceration, melting, and potential perforation. Um, how do we manage this currently? Well, this is based on the stage. Uh, essentially, in stage one, we're working on trying to improve the quality and transparency of the epithelium through the use of artificial tears, ointments, and potentially autologous serum and a therapeutic contact lens. In stage two, we're trying to promote epithelial uh, persistent epithelial defect uh, healing. And to get into, in addition to steps one, we may use amniotic uh, grafting as well as a tarsorophy uh, to manage these uh, patients. For stage three, uh, we're basically uh, focused on uh, preventing a corneal perforation. And here you might use recombinant nerve growth factor or regenerating um, uh, agents uh, uh, like these polymer uh, eye drops, uh, casicol. And then for perforations, obviously glue amniotic membranes and either lamellar or penetrating keratoplasty. So I want to talk a little bit about the nerve transfer concept. This is basically where we're using a nerve, uh, but a, 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 a transferring the use of a healthy but less valuable donor nerve uh, to help uh, uh, neurotize a more important sensory or motor uh, territory that's lost its innervation. And this is well established. Uh, uh, treatment in, for many clinical conditions but for both sensory motor and mixed sensory and motor impairment. So um, basically uh, for corneal neurotization, uh, this was actually a technique that was first described in 2009 by uh, Teresis. It basically used the contralateral, superorbital, and supertrochlear nerves uh, to provide uh, innervation to the contralateral side. In this paper, basically all patients uh, had improvement in corneal sensation, visual acuity, and corneal health. The problem with this technique is that it de-innervated de the contralateral forehead and scalp. It produced a large, uh, it required a large bicoronal incision and was not applicable in bilateral palsies and was a very uh, challenging uh, technique. Uh, bicoronal incisions, for those of you who don't know, it really involved a large uh, um, uh, flap with a large uh, scar that's created as shown here. Um, what they're doing is they're taking those supertrochlear and superorbital nerves to the contralateral side. Uh, this is from this paper showing the fascicles of the uh, nerve being brought down th uh, through the upper lid and then basically being laid on the surface of the um, underneath the conjunctiva uh, next to the cornea. And this is a patient from that uh, original paper showing improvement in their ocular surface uh, several months after uh, going, uh, uh, undergoing a, a corneal neurotization. Um, this technique was refined by Albez in, in 2014. And here what they did is they used a, uh, a graft, a sural nerve graft, uh, which is basically was employed between the brow regions to avoid that large bicoronal incision. And <clears throat> the, the uh, meticulous dissection that was required along the nerve. So the sural nerve, uh, we have to go back to our uh, medical school training, it's basically a purely uh, sensory nerve. It's, uh, it's located uh, on the uh, leg and basically um, removal of the sensory nerve creates a small area of uh, numbness over the anterolateral ankle and really doesn't interfere with mobility at all. Plus complications such as donor site infection, scarring, and neuropathic pain are very rare. So it's actually a preferred choice for harvesting um, for, from a number of different specialties because of the number of fascicles and the low donor site uh, morbidity. 
Um, this is one from one of our uh, patients here harvesting that nerve. So this is just a brief overview of the procedure from that paper where they're basically harvesting the sural nerve uh, here and then dissecting uh, through the upper brow and passing the donor uh, sural nerve across the um, brow here to the other side, uh, bringing that sural nerve down onto the surface of the cornea, separating the fascicles, and then basically <clears throat> uh, placing those fascicles along the, the side of the cornea and suturing them in place, and then co-opting that sural nerve to the uh, supraorbital and supratrochlear nerves uh, for the patient. And this is one of their patients uh, where you can see a big improvement in the neurotrophic uh, surface uh, several months after uh, um, the surgery. So they also have um, published some work showing uh, through in vivo confocal microscopy re uh, with this. Here you can see the patient above before the procedure and then after the procedure. The, uh, the picture is obviously much better and you can start to see the subbasal uh, nerve plexus here where above there's essentially nothing at the same um, tomography cut. So what we've been working on is actually using the ipsilateral great auricular nerve um, as well as the sural nerve uh, to uh, perform this technique and I'm working with my colleague uh, Dr. Jowett who's a um, ENT plastics person. Uh, the great auricular nerve originates from the cervical plexus and comes off uh, branches of the spine, spinal nerve uh, C2 and C3. It's a pure sensory nerve uh, that overlies the parotid and mastoid process in outer ear of the tragus. And it's commonly used uh, as a donor uh, nerve for uh, interposition graft repair and uh, has minimal uh, donor site morbidity and is easy to access. So how do we perform this procedure? Uh, we do this by using a sub-superficial musculoaponeurotic system flap, which is an S-mass, and uh, this is elevated on the ipsilateral side. We then isolate uh, the uh, great auricular nerve, uh, both its anterior and posterior divisions, and mobilize this to the uh, posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. These branches are then uh, dissected toward the lower lid, and. Um, and uh, uh, then we go ahead and harvest uh, the sural nerve uh, through an endoscopic approach. And basically, uh, to prevent axon loss, just use only the medial sural cutaneous component um, for the nerve. Uh, next, we, this may be more familiar to you, uh, we perform an inferior fornix based 100 degree pyridomy uh, and uh, pass the uh, sural nerve through the S mass plane to the lower lid. I'll show you a video of this in just a minute. And then do an interfascicular dissection of the graft is performed and we perform these scleral tunnels uh, to basically place the uh, fascicles of the nerve into these areas. Uh, you can see the fascicles separated here and then the scleral tunnels performed here. Uh, once that's performed, um, uh, the tunnels are placed into the pockets and we use basically fibrin glue to close the uh, uh, conjunctival pyridomy and uh, basically then go ahead and uh, co opt the great auricular nerve to the brand, to the um, sural nerve uh, in the end and perform a tarsorophy. So I'll show you this uh, video right here um, of the procedure. And you can see we're doing the dissection right here of the sural nerve isolating both its anterior and posterior branches. And then go ahead and harvest the sural nerve. Again, done endoscopically. I let the ENT people do this part. And once that's uh, done, we go ahead and do our uh, inferior fornix based pyridomy. And then uh, basically create these uh, scleral corneal tunnels. Oh, I'm sorry, we pull through the sural nerve first. And here you can see um, us passing it down uh, with a, I think this is a right needle. Uh, taking the sural nerve up uh, uh, through
through this um, S mass and pulling it out through the lower uh, fornix. This is about a three hour surgery, so it's not, uh, not quite like cataract surgery. And here we're um, separating the fascicles from the sural nerve. And then we've, we've already, you know, I guess we kind of backed it up here, but we've essentially created these pockets, these scleral pockets already before we do that. And then once these uh, corneal scleral pockets are in place, uh, with the other studies that were done, they basically just lied the nerves on the surface of the uh, sclera and, and sutured them down with 10 nylon. We felt this was much better, uh, uh, more direct innervation, and you can see the, um, after the fibrin glue is placed, you can see the um, ends or tips of the fascicles. Usually there's four to six fascicles per, um, per nerve, and obviously do the uh, tarsorophy, and this is coaptation of the sural nerve to the great auricular nerve. And again, we, they use fibrin glue here as well. I don't think we're used to seeing this much blood in cornea. So, and then here's uh, preoperative, and then several months postoperative. And you can see the ends of the uh, fascicles here, improvement on the ocular surface, improvement in vision uh, as well uh, for this uh, patient. And in this particular patient we just saw, uh, we actually used the rest of the sural nerve to re the lower lip of this patient uh, to, to um, a lot of these patients have cruelly uh, uh, and such, which can be a problem. Just a quick uh, case, this is a 31-year-old who came in to see us that had a vestibular frontal over section five years previously, and basically an exam showed a complete absence of corneal sensation. Uh, here's a preoperative and postoperative with the corneal uh, neurotization. And again, you can see that even changes in corneal topography uh, here with the patient having um, improved vision, as I mentioned before. What's really interesting is when they put eye drops in, they actually feel it in their ear uh, afterwards. Um, but uh, we've done uh, about four of these cases so far over the past year. All patients have improved, and it's quite uh, miraculous for uh, these uh, patients that have had very few options. So in conclusion, I think neurotrophic uh, keratitis requires close monitoring, threatens vision, and certainly imposes medical, social, and economic burdens to the patient. Uh, most treatments currently do not address the underlying cause of uh, corneal neurotization, or neur <laughs> neurotrophic keratitis, but corneal neurotization basically directly targets the neural pathology in uh, neurotrophic keratitis, provides a new source of innovation, and restores sensation and nerve-derived trophic support to the epithelium. Um, the uh, use of using a peripheral sensory nerve is prom promising technique for these patients and expands our ability to restore corneal sensation and also can be used prior to potential corneal plant, plant transplantation for advanced cases. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Dr. Pineda. We have two announcements before we continue. The first announcement is uh, that uh, we are having a symposium before lunch, so please stay and not uh, go. It's about dry eyes. And then the second announcement is that uh, Dr. Mirain, uh, unfortunately, due to health issues, could not make it. So we will be shifting a little bit around in the program. So now I will welcome again Dr. Koch uh, to talk to us about uh, some of uh, the limitations uh, in addition to the advancements in IOI calculation. Uh, the last uh, talk of the session will be by Dr. Pineda, so please uh, stay here after Dr. Koch and then Dr. Pineda and then this important. Well, thank you very much again, and we're going to talk a little bit more about intraocular lens calculations. Uh, the last talk addressed the cornea specifically, and I want to talk about some other issues, five issues specifically. 
I think it's important for us to understand how our formulas work. And I want to describe a way of reclassifying formulas. Um, so he, let's, let's go through this. This is a typical case, I wish. This patient had a target of minus one and a quarter. You can see the corneal power readings. The holiday one predicted minus 1.26, and the patient ended up minus one and a quarter. Typical, that's what we all get, right? Within a hundredth of a diopter. Well, um, the perfect result could be the fact that this patient had perfect measurements and a perfect formula. It could also be due to the fact that the measurement had an error in one direction, the formula had an error in the other direction, and they compensated for each other. Or it could be that the refraction was not accurate. And the point is, as I sort of mentioned in the prior talk, there's a lot, there, you know, a lot going on in this whole process of calculating eye well power. And uh, why don't they all turn out like this? Well, for our lens calculations, we measure anterior corneal curvature, we measure the axial length, we measure the anterior chamber depth, we measure lens thickness, again, depending on the device you have available, and we measure corneal diameter. And formulas use various combinations of these data. Uh, right now, we're only making assumptions about the posterior cornea, as I mentioned. And the goal of the formulas is basically to calculate the effective lens position. And that is basically to say, after you take out a thick crystalline lens, where is the lens implant going to sit? So most formulas that we use are variants of the Virgin's formula based on sort of regular optics, and that's the power of the IOL, and then we have our axial length. There, there is the effective lens position, which is calculated by a separate formula uh, for each of the programs. You have the corneal power, and then there's the refraction. Well, how well do we do? Uh, in clinical practice, we actually only get about 70 to 80 percent plus or minus a half diopter, unless you really, really work at it. And uh, the best that I've seen reported was Warren Hill's uh, RBF formula, in which he reported 91 percent within a half diopter. I must admit, we don't get quite that good with it. And, uh, but even if you did get 91 percent, that's great, right? Well, that means that 1 in 11 patients are off by more than a half diopter still, even in this very, very uh, outstanding results. So we have all these new formulas, and we, use, we, we typically describe them as generations, first generation, third, fifth generation. Well, what generation is the Barrett Universal? What generation is this in the lattice formula? There are new, these new formulas, and I think the generation dis, uh, categorization is, is really confusing. So I'd like to, I think we should get rid of it and we should talk about the formulas by how they work mechanistically. So there are formulas that are based on geometric optics. Those are most of the ones that we use, the Holiday Formulas 1 and 2, the Hoffer Q, the Hygus, and the Barrett Universal 2. And they use different numbers of variables to perform their calculations. Some of them use two variables, some use three, some use five, one uses seven. So, for example, you would call the Holiday 2 a seven-variable versions formula or geometric optical formula. There are ray tracing formulas. That's another category. The two that are commercially available are FACO Optics from Olsen and Oculix from Preussner in Germany. There are formulas that are based on artificial intelligence, which means you take a huge amount of data and you do interesting things with the data to try to come up with a formula. And uh, you see some of them listed there, the most recent, of course, being the Hill formula. And finally, there are combination formulas that, have, uh, that use multiple formulas. Usually, there are geometric optic formulas, but sometimes they combine others as well. And I think if we start talking about our formulas that way, it'll be helpful. I think in the future, the ultimate is we're going to be doing ray tracing, because ray tracing will take into effect uh, the uh, higher order aberrations in the cornea and in the lens, uh, lens implant that we're going to be putting in, but they still don't do a good job of calculating effective lens position. What do I use in my practice? I like the Holiday One and the Holiday Consultant. I like the Barrett Universal Two, and I like the Hill RBF. I sometimes use the Olson. Okay, point number two: the long eye is not as long as we think. In long eyes, what happens often? is that our formulas calculate lenses that are not strong enough, and our patients end up hyperopic. 
And to take a patient who's minus 10 and make that patient plus one is, is obviously quite frustrating for a patient who's used to at least seeing something up close. And I think it's due to the fact that the vitreous cavity is disproportionately long in the axial myopic eye. So the front of the eye is the same, but the eye lengthens in the back. So my colleague, Lee Wong, came to me one day in the office and she said, I've been playing around with optimizing the length of the eye that we use in the formula, not the surgeon factor. And this is the formula that we use. Uh, this is uh, the Holiday 2, Holiday 1 formula. And we use it for eyes that are 25.2 or longer. And this is the formula. It looks kind of crazy with all those values. But if you have a measured axial length of 28, you insert that into the formula here, and you end up with a new value of 27.49. You put that back into your formula and into the lens star of the IOL master, rerun the calculations, and you select the IOL that is closest to Plano on the minus side. So the first click on the minus. And uh, these are the formulas. They're published and available. Um, and uh, we have found that if we take the, uh, if we, these are in, for patients who had IOL powers from minus five to plus five, if we, optim if we use the lens constant from the manufacturer, they ended up very hyperopic. This is plus one, plus two. If you optimize the surgeon factor just for those lenses, you still ended up with a large variability. But if you optimize the axial length, we get a very tight number. Now, the good news for many of you is that if you have the Barrett Universal 2 and the Heal RBF, they're getting better and better because they're they've kind of learned from this. Um, th we still think ours is a little bit better, but the good news is you've got to think about the long eye and be careful to avoid hyperopia. The Barrett, the Hill, or the Wang Koch uh, modification, and this is a paper by Fram and Maskett showing that the, uh, the mean absolute error was lower with our formula than the Olson and the Barrett, but those are certainly doing better. Okay, that's the long eye. Shorter eyes are even harder. A uh, patient of mine who used to be plus two, 78, He's less hyperopic now. The target is minus a quarter. Uh, there's the lens calculation. 24 would be minus 0.26. And uh, the Holiday 1 predicts that. The Holiday 2 says minus 0.47. I put the uh, IOL in. The patient ended up, instead of minus a quarter, minus one and a quarter. Why is that? Well, as it turns out, this patient had an anterior chamber depth of 2.19. So the hyperopes are tough because um, um, we, we did a study on them using all of the new formulas. It's, in, it's, it's being published by JCRS. And these are eyes that have an axial length range from 18.8 to 22. Um, six, and uh, what we found is none of the formulas hit 75% within a half diopter. And the best ones actually were the Holiday 1 and the Holiday 2, even better than the, the Barrett and the Hill. And, um, and that's what we found that kind of interesting. The Holiday 2 seems to be the best, at least in our data set. And the, the issue is that the effect of lens position is really critical. You've got a small space in these eyes, and you have a high-powered eye well, 26, 28, 30 diopters. And so very small variations in that power can really affect the accuracy. So what do I do? I use the Holiday 1 and the Holiday 2. I use the RBF. I use the Barrett and I also use the Olsen, and uh, try to come up with some kind of a, a summary for them. And what I tell the patients is, I warn them of this, and I warn them that in particular, they might end up more myopic than predicted if they have a really shallow anterior chamber. Okay, let's go to astigmatism. Um, and uh, here's a patient of mine who had with the rule astigmatism. You can see in the glasses, 1.25 at 85 degrees in plus cylinder form. These are the various readings, all anterior corneal readings, 1.66, 173, 2.01. The refractive target was minus 1.4 with no astigmatism. I put in a toric lens to correct one and a half diopters of astigmatism for this. It ended up beautifully aligned where I wanted it, and I flipped the axis the patient developed against the rule of astigmatism. That was one of the cases that educated me and began my thinking about the importance of the posterior cornea. So here's a patient that I operated on a few years later when I was a little smarter. Uh, one and a quarter at 175 in this case. 
And these are the anterior corneal readings here. They're all about a diopter against the rule. The, this is the Galilei 1.24. This is the Cassini 1.35, showing that there's more astigmatism. So the target was Plano. I put again a 1.5 diopter lens aligned at 171, and the patient ended up Plano. So in the first case, I didn't take into account the posterior cornea. In the second case, I did. So what is the astigmatism of the human cornea? Well, in the anterior cornea, it tends to be steep vertically when we're young, and it's against the rule. It goes steep horizontally as we, as we age, and uh, it's remarkable what a consistent pattern I, I see in my patients and have experienced personally. The posterior cornea tends, though, to be steep vertically in most patients. And because the posterior cornea is a minus lens, it creates vertic that vertical steepness creates plus refractive power that actually is along the horizontal meridian or it creates against the rule refractive astigmatism. How much does it induce? Well, if the cornea looks like this on the front, it has with the rule astigmatism, the more the anterior astigmatism, this is the astigmatism in the anterior corneal surface, the posterior corneal astigmatism also increases. And that means the posterior corneal astigmatism, by increasing, is actually compensating to some measure for the anterior corneal astigmatism. So a patient that may have four diopters of with the rule on the front, total corneal astigmatism may only be three diopters because it can be as high as a diopter on the back. Against the rule astigmatism is different. If this is what the cornea looks like on the front, the more anterior corneal astigmatism there is, there really isn't much change in the posterior corneal astigmatism, but it can be as high as a half diopter. So if you calculate your lens, your toric lenses, based on the anterior corneal surface only, you're going to overcorrect with the rule of astigmatism, and you're going to undercorrect against the rule of astigmatism because of the posterior cornea. So how do we take that into account? What do we do? Well, we use regression formulas that are based on averages from the population, or we can measure it. And I've mentioned that these technologies. Um, so the regression formulas we have are the Baylor nomogram, the, uh, the Barrett toric calculator, the Abelafia Koch formula, the AMO toric calculator, and the Alcon toric calculator, which is actually the same as the Barrett. And what they give you is about 80% plus or minus a half diopter. So, you know, we're, we're doing fairly well. We're not doing great. Why aren't we doing better? We aren't doing better is because with regression approaches, that just as in those post-LASIK eyes or the posterior cornea, there's, you know, there's a lot of variability in the population. Look at that patient, 0.8 diopters in the posterior corneal astigmatism with two and a half diopters of with the rule. So because of that variation, we really want to be able to tailor or select the eye well specifically for that patient. And so can we really measure these corneas in order to do that? There was a study using the uh, Pentacam that came uh, from, uh, from Wrightblatt um, and they looked at anterior corneal power uh, with, a, with a sh the, the pentacam, and they found that the residual astigmatism, the accuracy was plus or minus a half in 70% with a pentacam. 70%. And what did I just tell you? The regression formulas are around 80%. So measuring the posterior cornea with Scheinfluke technology still isn't better right now than just using the, uh, the formulas you have that are based on regression. But direct measurement's getting better. These are data that we generated using the Iwell Master 700, which is a swept source OCT, which is basically a, a faster OCT. And it gets six scans of the cornea, and it measures corneal thickness, as I mentioned before, in order to calculate posterior corneal curvature. And uh, I'm going to show you a, a, a display, and I want to sort of, you're going to see this more and more in the literature, the difference between a single angle and a double angle plot. The way we look at patients with a four opter is, this is where with a rule, this is vertical astigmatism, and this is horizontal astigmatism on each side. That means the data for against the rule astigmatism are not clustered together, and it makes it hard to analyze it. So a double angle plot literally does that. It takes 90 degrees and doubles it to 180, and the 180 is doubled around here to 360 or zero, and now all the with the rule eyes are here, and the against the rule eyes are here. So it's a different way of looking at it, but it helps us get the data all together. 
So here is our results using the IOL Master 700 for patients with against the rule astigmatism, 92 eyes. If we just use the anterior corneal readings, you can see that the, air, the data are clustered on the against the rule side, and indeed it was a quarter diopter. If we use the total corneal power measurement, it's shifted more to the center, and the error is actually only a tenth of a diopter. Now that's a small change, but it's encouraging to think that a direct measurement might actually be a little bit more accurate. P-value was almost significant, not quite. And that tenth of a diopter actually may be tilt of the IOL, which is a whole other topic. Now, unfortunately, the data for the with the rule astigmatism is much worse for this technology. And, it, and so it's still not ready for our use uh, at this point, although we're working hard to try to see if we can make it better. And I mentioned to you the Cassini. I want to share with you again the Cassini. I mentioned the anterior corneas, the LEDs, the posterior cornea, and there's ray tracing. This is the image from the Cassini. There's the reflection of the LED off the anterior cornea, and there it is off the posterior cornea. Pretty neat to be able to see that. And they can measure where that is and calculate the astigmatism. And here's a patient showing that. Uh, 1.5 diopters with the biometer. Uh, the Cassini values you see here, 1.44 at 88. The total corneal astigmatism is 1.22. One diopter toric lens was put in with a target of Plano, and the predicted error ended up being 0.68 with the biometer and a little bit less with the Cassini. So again, we're just beginning to get little bits of encouraging data that suggest that maybe we'll be able to measure these patients. I mentioned aberrometry earlier. Um, can aberrometry really be that accurate if we, in the middle of surgery, we've given drops, we've operated on the patients, um, when we have all these changes that have occurred as opposed to the patient in the office when everything is pristine? And these are data from two different studies, and this is a table I'm copy, modified from Rudy Knight's. And this is a comparison of just doing registration with a Zeiss Callisto as opposed to using Aura. And the mean error for the astigmatism was 0.29 with a Callisto, just getting it lined up right. And the Aura was not as accurate. But there, there's another study from Bob Sioni and Woodcock, and they used the Aura, and they got the same value. So, you know, you can kind of pick and choose among these devices. But I personally rarely use Aura for my astigmatism measurements. I just use it when I really have some questions based on the pre-op measurements. So, um, and I think it does seem to be helpful in the post-refractive eyes on occasion. Um, but it's, I think, a, really a technology that is, probably has a short lifespan. I think we'll probably end up soon going away from intraoperative aberrometry. So finally, if you don't get it right the first time, post-op adjustment is very intriguing. This is the RX site, it used to be called Calhoun Lens, and it changes, you change the curvature by implanting a lens that has monomers that are not polymerized. So they're basically loose in the lens, and then you can selectively irradiate them so that they create an osmotic gradient and other monomers come into that and, and fill the gap and it changes the shape of the lens. You can treat hyperopia, myopia, astigmatism, and then you use a laser to lock it in place. Sounds great, but what happens is patients have to wear sunglasses for two weeks until, or three weeks until you do the treatment because ultraviolet light is what is used. And it takes sometimes two treatments to get the correction and two additional treatments to lock it in. So you're talking about four treatments in your patients postoperatively. That's a lot of work. But incredibly accurate, as I'll show you. Now, this is the other technology that's being looked at where you can use a laser for any lens implant that's in a patient's eye using a special femtosecond laser, and you can change the refractive index of a small segment of it, and by so doing, you can actually correct the power. So here are data with using the uh, light adjustable lens, the RX side of the Calhoun lens, uh, out of uh, Briarly, I think that's out of Moorfields, 34 eyes, 21 patients, one, two, or three adjustments, and two lock-ins, up to five treatments. The mean absolute error, these are in post-LASIK eyes, they're within 0.19 diopters, and they got 74% within a quarter diopter, and 97% within a half diopter. Incredible results. So it is pretty neat that way. 
here's an example now of the of using the perfect lens refract it's called refractive index shaping uh, and again that's the image I showed you you can change uh, spherical power touristy and you can add or remove torrid uh, multifocality and here just are some data in the laboratory where the intended change is 0.5 and they got 0.51 and you can see that all of these intended changes are within three hundredths of the actual one. So this is a really exciting technology. So we've got a lot of advances. We've got better biometers, better formulas. We know a lot more about what we're doing. And our, we have these neat technologies for uh, modifying power. But despite these advances, most of us are around 80% within a half diopter. We do worse for more complex eyes. Corneal measurements are still a challenge and we still haven't figured out how to accurately predict effective lens position in such a way that we can really get better results based purely on preoperative measurements. But I think we'll get there and um, it's an exciting time for this area. Thanks very much. Very comprehensive and extremely useful. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. The last, uh talk for the session is by Dr. Roberto Pineda. Um, it's about getting clear a foldable artificial cornea and uh, as you might have noticed and actually truthfully Dr. Pineda uh, internationally and nationally has had the reputation of treating the impossible very irregular cornea, skeletal prosthesis, topography guided, cornea nerve crafting and today he's going to talk about this very exciting uh, new technology. So I just want to share with you um, uh, some uh, work that we've done with the uh, Caraclear uh, foldable cornea with some uh, five-year uh, results. I don't have any, um, uh, don't have any uh, conflicts of interest here. But we know there's um, worldwide interest uh, growing in uh, keratoprosthetic devices. And uh, many corneal conditions are considered high risk uh, for conventional penetrating keratoplasty, such as multiple graft failure, aniridia, limbal, limbal stem cell deficiencies, and uh, OCP or SJS. But uh, likewise, many countries don't have tissue uh, due to absence of eye banks or paucity of tissue uh, that would, re uh, require, would be required where keratoprosthesis is utilized. So there are a number of keratoprosthesis devices uh, available. Um, two models used most frequently are the OOKP, which is a three-step uh, procedure, and the Boston keratoprosthesis, uh, which is a one-step procedure and, and one that most people are familiar with. This is just a graph showing utilization of the Boston keratoprosthesis. Uh, there's been over 13,000 of these devices implanted, and you can see the pink bar there uh, represents the international use, which has uh, grown uh, significantly uh, since um, uh, 2008. Uh, the Caraclear device was basically invented by E.J. Shui. He's a cornea specialist who actually trained at Mass Sinair and was inspired by Dr. Dolman's work for the Boston keratoprosthesis. Uh, this uh, device is a single, foldable, single piece uh, artificial cornea. It has no back plate, no locking ring. It's made of a biocompatible uh, acrylic material, which is seven millimeters in diameter and has a central uh, four millimeter optic with 18 peripheral holes as shown in the figure here, which are used to basically fixate, hydrate, and uh, uh, provide nutrients to the remaining cornea. And it comes in different depths, which range from about 300, uh, uh, designed to be placed in either 300 or 600 uh, micron depth uh, pocket. So this is an intralamellar uh, corneal graft. Uh, it's essentially inserted uh, through a central 3.5 millimeter uh, uh, diameter incision in an 800, I'm sorry, 8 millimeter uh, uh, lamellar pocket graft, which is uh, made by a femtosecond laser. So this is actually a very uh, tissue sparing procedure. It requires uh, removal of less than actually 5% of the patient's uh, total cornea to implant. And it, uh, like in the past two years, received a CE uh, mark approval. So what are the indications for use of this device? It's essentially for non-inflammatory uh, corneal blindness, uh, where obviously visual acuity is significantly decreased. So you're looking at patients who have failed grafts, limbal stem cell deficiency, scars, different uh, corneal dystrophies, or even keratoconus. Uh, the contraindications are um, for uh, chronic inflammatory conditions like OCP and SJS, and severe dry eyes, as well as full thickness uh, corneal um, opacities. Uh, this is, I'm going to show you two brief uh, videos here. 
Um, this is just uh, my first case. Uh, we, we're doing an FDA trial now. Oop, I'm sorry about the audio. That wasn't supposed to be there. I had to do it at, uh, thank you, do it at 2x because uh, it's a bit slow. Um, but it's, this is on the um, IFS uh, laser. And um, we, when you're going deeper into the cornea, this is a 300 micron depth cornea and uh, it takes a few minutes. I'm gonna skip to the other one. We peel off the, the, the list here. This is just another uh, video taking off the uh, uh, top here. It usually comes off quite uh, easily. We use a slightly higher energy than you would with the standard uh, LASIK flap. Um, the uh, lamellar flap is dissected and then basically the Caraclear is inserted through this uh, lamellar pocket and put into place as you see here, and then there's usually a few anchoring sutures uh, that are placed. And that's it. So it goes pretty fast. Um, it can be used in multiple different situations. Here's a case of multiple uh, graft failure. Patient's hand motion preoperative, 2060 postoperative. Here's a case of uh, corneal burn with limbal stem cell deficiency, pre-op count fingers, post-op 2020. Patient with Reese Buchler, corneal dystrophy, 2400 pre op, 2040 post op, and a patient with keratoconus who's 2040 pre op and 2030 post op. Uh, if you look at the clinical data, this is uh, from, uh, this is not from myself, it's from uh, Dr. Vargas. Uh, 26 patients who had this procedure outside the US with pre op diagnosis of failed grafts, burns, corneal dystrophy, scars, and keratoconus. Average follow up was uh, nearly uh, five years. Vision ranged uh, from uh, pre -op, 2100 to hand motion pre-op, and all patients had improvement of visual acuity, averaging seven lines. Of course, um, this was not without complications. Uh, one patient had uh, infectious uh, uh, ulceration. Another patient had uh, corneal melting, but there were no cases of glaucoma, retroprosthetic membranes, or endophthalmitis, and the retention rate was nearly 90% at three years. If we compare this to other, um, uh, other uh, keratoprosthetic devices, like the Boston Keratoprosthesis or AlphaCore, which is no longer around, you can see that um, the uh, lines of improvement are seven, vision is excellent, uh, uh, 92% having better than 2200 or better, and again, no cases of endophthalmitis, retroprosthetic membranes, or glaucoma. The, uh, there was extrusions, there was corneal melting, and there was uh, 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 corneal car infectious keratitis, but these are all very similar to the Boston keratoprosthesis in many ways better in that we don't have to deal with some of these other uh, issues which are very relevant in keratoprosthetic surgery. So why do we think about the Caraclear instead of penetrating keratoplasty? We don't have to worry about in, uh, rejection. Uh, there's um, actually control of the astigmatism compared to corneal transplant. Uh, there, you can do uh, a prescription, can be customized with the device. Uh, it's a non-penetrating surgery. Uh, it's relatively fast uh, recovery. There's a little bit of edema day one, but it goes away quite quickly. You don't need donor tissue and you can perform it in your office as opposed to an operating room. So this um, uh, keratoprosthesis is really a, uh, the only foldable and plantable device without entering the anterior chamber and can be implanted, I'm sorry, and uh, minimizes the risk for infection or hemorrhage. Uh, it can be implanted um, uh, with the option of doing a corneal transplantation in the future if needed. And the pressure remains normal after implantation, so you don't have to worry about uh, glaucoma surgery uh, in the future, which is a big issue for the Boston keratoprosthesis, and it requires few, few uh, sutures. So in conclusion, the uh, Caraclear is a foldable artificial cornea that can be implanted into a pocket without penetrating into the anterior chamber. The five-year results show that uh, the device can improve uh, vision in those patients who are corneal blind with a, with a wide range of conditions and has good retention and it is a good potential alternative to penetrating keratoplasty. There, the company is expanding the range of Caraclears, uh, so it can be placed deeper into the cornea for those patients that have thicker corneas and um, allow more customization. Thank you very much.
We have three years follow up with the corner remodeling. We have doing cross linking at the same time with PRK. And we, we have done that two years later than we did the corner remodeling because we are afraid about the, 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 the scar, the wood. Because we have, you know, that cross linking kill the keratocytes, and we have to be careful with that. Then we do cross linking in seven millimeter. We don't go to eight millimeter. Just just in the center of the eye, and we uh, wait uh, two years. Just a few cases we did cross linking before of treatment. But uh, we think that it's better to wait because it's better to modify the cornea when the cornea is weak than modifying the cornea when the cornea is, is strong. Then we wait two years. And, uh, another question about uh, in, in the rings uh, in the cornea, we can do it the uh, lifting cornea? Yes, but we have to remove the, the, the uh, intracornea rings. M most of the our cases, we remove first the, the rings we wait one month uh, to, to be clear the cornea again, and we do cornea remodeling. And do you remove the suture later? The, the, the suture? The suture. Yeah, we, we began to remove the suture depending on the age. In young people, we, we began to remove six months later, and in the old people, we wait 10 months, sometimes one year. We are we, we go to removing some stitches, some suture, depending on the stigmatism. It's like a cornea transplant. But here is your self cornea and you have a perfect perfect uh, 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 position of the tissues. Okay. And the last is uh, how stable are the cornea change after remodeling? Uh, the cornea is longest uh, follow up. Follow up. I didn't understand. Uh, uh, how stable uh, are the cornea chains after remodeling? Uh, the cornea is the longest following. Yeah, we have just three years. And it, it has been good. When you stretch the cornea, the cornea getting strong. It's like, uh, you know, uh, uh, when you stretch, it's stronger the cornea. We, we, we are not sure if this patient will need cross linking because the cornea is stable. After that, because you cannot go back with the keratoconus because the tissues is not there. Now the tissues is not in the cornea. You can get again progression, other progression of keratoconus, but uh, this patient doesn't cannot have the keratoconus previous that he had because you don't have the tissues inside the eye. Then it's very stable. So um, I personally have no experience with the Caraclear in pediatric patients. I know that it's been um, utilized. Uh, I don't have specific data on that in pediatric patients long term. Most of the patients do. So the pediatric experience, I think, is very limited, actually globally, for the people that have utilized it. But um, I'm sure that's a potential group of patients that might benefit from the device. Uh, second is most patients do use a contact lens for optimal visual quality, so they do need to be on chronic steroids, I'm sorry, chronic antibiotics uh, with the contact lens. Not every patient retains or can retain the uh, contact lens, and we have several patients who do not use a contact lens and have pretty good vision, but you have better vision if you are able to use the contact lens. And, um, but antichronic antibiotics uh, are needed, and steroids are plus minus. So some patients need to stay on long-term steroids, some other patients don't. Um, a question to Dr. Cope. The question is, um, do you think there is any benefit uh, in, uh, in a formula that incorporates the white-to-white -white horizontal and vertical 
in order to better predict the toricity, especially in vertical uh, astigmatism where we have a lot of variability. So instead of just predicting uh, an average uh, corneal astigmatism, uh, is there any benefit from looking at the difference between the right and right horizontal and the middle? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I, it's not been shown that it makes a difference. And it's tricky because, as we know, the, uh, the cornea is, on the front is different than the cornea on the back because of the, of the way the, the conjunctiva encroaches on the cornea along the, the vertical meridian. So um, I think that, uh, you know, ultimately we just really want to measure the central cornea. And I think that's going to be more promising because, again, you would be doing some kind of extrapolation from the diameter and, and I'm not sure that that would take us down the road. I think we, uh, it's been looked at a little bit and hasn't, hasn't panned out yet. Now, another question, there are two new modalities of topographies and topographies. One incorporating Lacido in the front, OCT in the back, and another which is purely from OCT. Is there any advantages on the anterior surface of Lacido versus OCT or other way around on the anterior surface? I don't think OCT is going to work for the anterior surface. It's not going to be as accurate as a reflection technology. Uh, the advantage of the placido on the anterior surface is that you're going to get a more comprehensive measurement of corneal asphericity and other higher aberrations. And with a good ray tracing formula, I think that's very intriguing and, and maybe promising. You know, the, the, uh, the, the Iowa Master 700 now has three zones of six spots at each zone, and they can do a lot with that. But I think as you start to fill in all those gaps with placido or some other form of topography, a reflection topography, you will see a real, uh, I, think, I think the accuracy, particularly in irregular corneas, of the accuracy of ray tracing formulas may be better than others. It's a good question. Okay, thank you. With this, we conclude the session for today, where we have the symposium of uh, Bashalom with Dr. Asimli. And then Bashalom, I'm going to introduce this. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, on behalf of Boshalom and LOS, I would like to invite Dr. Amrullah Tashadi, who is our speaker from uh, Turkey. He is also the head of ophthalmology department at Khan Medical University. Um, he is going to discuss some new developments and treatment options for uh, the management of dry eye with us today. So please help me in welcoming him on the stage. Thank you. Dear colleagues, thank you very much for the Lebanese Ophthalmic Society inviting me here. And thank you very much, uh, Bao Shan uh, gave a chance to talk in their symposium. Yes, we just discussed in two last two days about all incredible new technologies. But what we need always is a perfect ocular surface. If we don't have a perfect ocular surface, then it doesn't work because the patient wants with us is always what's going on and without any pain, just seeing everything well. So dry eye, I think, is a very important issue to talk about. And years and years ago, this discussion begins. And then slowly and slowly progressing. We know that the lacrimal system is a complete and complex system. What we are doing that, the neurological part the epithelium, eyelids, meobiumin glands, all are working together to get a better uh, ocular surface. What, what about a healthy tear? We all know that if a healthy tear we have, we have all three layers together, lipids and then aqueous, and afterwards the mucin layers has to be stable and comprehensive working on the ocular surface. So this makes us, if any change of these substances that take us to dry eye. Dry eye, when we look at the old times, keratoconjunctivitis, sicca, it's a, we all know that it's a multifactorial disease and the ocular surface. And there's instability, hyperosmolarity is very important. And when we're looking at it, we just see that 
dry eye definitions are changing slowly and slowly. In these definitions, we have to look at the pathophysiology. We all that know that the tear osmolarity is very important. And the cytokines, the role of other uh, cell damages, cell exchanges, and then tear instability takes a very important role on the dry eye. First definition come in 1995, industry working uh, group. And at that time, this only known as the, a disorder of the tear field due to tear deficiency. But in 2006, Delphi consensus just group dysfunction tear syndrome makes us come to 2007 use dry eye workshop working. It's, I, I think it's in a very important millennium on uh, ocular surface because this, we just know that it's a multi, we understand that it's a multifactorial disease of the tears and ocular surface. And this is the first time mentioned accompanied by increased osmolarity of the tear film and inflammation. In last 10 years, we work with this definition and we've just gone with these terms of uh, treatment models. But it doesn't come enough. At last, about the end of 2017, this group from 64 doctors from all countries just review all the articles and just review all the workshops and others and just come to a conclusion and we call it due stood for uh, this year. What's changing there? This is the same, the a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface, yes. This is a loss of homeostasis of the tear film and tear film instability and hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation, and this is the first time that neurosensory abnormalities play ethical, etiological roles added to this work. When we look at the old part, we just see that the dry eye in the first use, we just separate completely it to two dimensions, acute deficiency and evaporation. But when we look at this new definition, induced two, this changed because when we look at there, the important thing is the patient here. When we just look at that, the patient can be asymptomatic or symptomatic. Before that definition, we just try to find the symptomatic patients, but the working, when the workshop's going a long time, just show us that there are very many patients that going on asymptomatic, but they have the signs of ocular uh, surface diseases. This makes the definition and treatment plans a little bit different. And we know with this workshop that the dry eye disease now is a complete mixed disease with acute defi deficient and evaporation together. The evaporative dry eye has a greater share, and 30% of these are mixed. And this is the first time that my bombing gland dysfunction is considered to be leading cause of dry eye in the population. And also, acute deficiency is related with tear gland, and the evaporation related with the eyelids and my bombing glands are the main factor. So, this definition gives us the one differentiating dry eye disease and concomitant diseases, differentiating evaporative and acute, non symptomatic patients with signs, and symptomatic patients without signs included to the therapies of this group. Why? Because this makes us coming to the discussion of the risk factors. This workshop also just mentioned us that the risk factors are very important, especially the medication of antidepressant diuretics, contraceptives, including all the age and other ones. But medications are very, uh, act, taking a very active role in dry eye diseases. And this makes up the other risk factors. Now, today we know that blepharitis is a very important problem. 
and also the history of laser refractive surgery, laser refractive, I know refractive surgeon, very long years, and just we mentioned it's changing all the power of the cornea, including the biometric power and also the dry eye. So histology of chronic conjunctivitis, contact lens usage, and frequency of preservative containing drops just affects the dry uh, corneal ocular surfaces. But we have the modifiable factors. We can have the chance to change the humidity, high temperature, air conditioning use, smoking environment, and computer use. If we use them, we have the chance to lower the rate of uh, dry eye patients, including the symptoms. We all know the symptoms, but I don't want to mention them again. But the important, very important thing that the blurry vision comes to the front with these dry eye patients very importantly. We all also know the signs, but when we look at the, um, the polyclinics, if we don't have time, this workshop advises us first to look lower tear frame strip, tear debris, conjunctival hyperomia, appearance of the meibomian glands, and conjunctival chalazis. If we just have just see these signs, this patient has to be uh, defined as the dry eye and has to be examined. Also, the questionnaires are very important if we have time and if we have the stuff. And also, we have to make the test for the uh, dry eye diagnosis and Schirmer and tear break eye time is still the best leading ones. Of course, there are very many other uh, testing styles, but in my opinion, fluorescent staining is the very important, just taking both breakup time and also the, any problems on the cornea is very important. Also, it's very important for me to use the lysamine green staining. And by that way, we have the chance to see the, any problems on the conjunctiva if it's going on. And if we are treating the patients in a well condition or not, I think it's very important. There are very many new and modern ways of die, uh, test. We have the meniscometries, we have film stabilities, we have the chance to uh, observe the tear ob uh, osmolarity, but these are not always stable and to give the same results in all patients. Also, in the near future, we are going to look at the laser enzymes and the acute deficiency and biomarker assays are going to be more important in every day and we are just sharing, getting good news that in the future we have the chance to use them more for diagnosis. What we are treating, we have just need and health it here. This is a very old, but I like it very much because we have just seen the, a complex mixture of proteins, mucins and electrolytes, everything inside. What's not in the normal tear film, we have to look at the lesser concentrations and growth factor concentrations and cytokines are very important. So this increased electrolytes just gives us very important notices. And this takes us to the treatment goal. In the treatment, we have to first reduce the surface inflammation. We have to correct the neutral feedback. We have to reduce lacrimal gland inflammation in order to stabilize the fear film. When we look at DUS-1, with the stages and the treatment options doesn't make any change in DUS-2. They are all the same. But the difference is you don't have, we don't have to follow all the stages after and after. If we just see the combination and mixed type of the dry eye, we have to choose any treatment op option which is beneficial for the patient. So we all know that in all stages of dry eye treatment, we need artificial tears. And artificial tears are going to be modifying every day and there are very many on the market. In my opinion, the 
ideal artificial tear has a tear stabilizing effect. It has to high water retency, it has to remain longer on the ocular surface, it has to be prolonged tear breakup time, it's effect, it has to be effective on mucine, aqueous, and lipid layers. When we look at all these, then we can have the chance to look at our ideal artificial tear. Also, it has to increase wetness and the lubrication and reduce friction on the ocular surfaces, including the protective and regenerative effect on the corneal epithelium. Preservatives always a discussion, but the kind of the preservatives are very important from uh, drop to the drop. But in the important thing is we have lipid layer, we have water layer, we have mucin layer, and we have today all the artificial tears has to contain all these components. There are very many drops on the market, but today is the symposium of the Bosch and Nom, and they are going to give uh, the two new drops on the market. I think all lubricants, all artificial tears, best thing is just clearing the cornea, stabilizing the ocular surface, and giving us a good and healthy vision. One of them is, well, Bosch and Lom, new product is Artelag Night Time Lamp. In Turkey, we have it a very long time, and we are using it a very long time. What is the importance of this uh, gel? We know that lipid deficiencies are 77% of dry eye patients, and alone or the combination with other conditions, we have the lipid definitions, deficiencies. Also, tear changes within, are increasing with ages, and evaporation also increasing with the ages. Then we know that, secondly, we need the water inside of it. And import, evaporation is a very important role in the modern life. In Artelac nighttime, we have carbomer, sorbitol, medium chain triglycerides, cetramide, sodium hydroxide. We all know about carbomer, it's, but it's, the uh, concentration is very important. It's two milligrams. What, uh, how these Artelac effects? When we look at the natural tear film, lipids, aqueous, and mucin has the same effect. But if we just put these three ingredients, middle chain trigular series by with aqueous and the carbomer at the bottom, we have the chance to continue all the stabilized epithelium, uh, over epithelium, the tear film. In this group, for patients with hyperoperative dry eye with lit or lipid deficiency is a very good group. Also in epiphora, photophobia, in these signs and symptoms, it's working very well. How does it work? Carbomol vehicles and triglycerides are stabilizing. And the carbomer just going down, the accused just in the middle, and the Triglycerides are at the top. Why carbomer? Carbomer is a very important bioadhesive property. And to accuse tear products, high viscosity of carbomel gel provides longer retention and it's very important. What does it making with these medium chain triglycerides? Carbomer with trigly uh, medium uh, triglycerides they combine with the water, and these carbomer molecules form a chain-like coagulation, and this medium chain triglycerides, it will work together. And this, when we, these are all working together, this middle chain fatty acids act as lipophilic lubricant and just stabilize the aqueous uh, over the corneal epithelium. There are some studies. I just passed them quickly. It's an open label prospective stability uh, breakup time and shear values are calculated. And these, they look at the baselines uh, for three months. In the shimmer values, the shimmer at the baselines are about 4.8 millimeters. 
quickly after the using of RTL at night time jet, just in three months, uh, rapidly increased to the 8.2 millimeter. I don't uh, just think that this carbomer and triglyceride is not just for nighttime. For swear cases of the patients who has uh, stage two, three, or four dry eyes, I'm using it regularly on the daytime as well. But for the normal dry eye patients, nighttime is very important. You all know that in, during the nighttime, all the aqueous layers are lowering and they have, the patients have a very big problems for opening the eyes, pain and redness in the morning time. This three carbomer and triglycerides and the water content uh, gel just optimize the corneal epithelium during the night and it works very well uh, when the patients feel very good in the morning. Also, when we look at the dryness sensation of these patients, as I told you to, just have a very lowering effect of the sensation and itching problems. Again, one more study, two day follow up with the uh, healthy subjects. They look at the uh, break up times and after like nighttime gel treatment significantly just higher the break up time from uh, 10 seconds to 30 seconds in a very short time. Also, again, this healthy subjects uh, break up time increases the patient's longing time is very good com uh, if we compare to the no treatment group. One more group, I think nearly the same, but the important thing here is the Artelac Beautic breakup time single administration, and it takes a very long time, about 20, 120 minutes, you know, just comparing to the base, just have a very good increase of breakup time compared to the base level after 120 minutes. It's, it's a long time and it's protecting cornea very well, I think. So, Artelac Nighttide Gel is, a, is working very well. Most of the patients who has lipid deficiencies, myobomian gland diseases. The last and the second product is Recogel. I'm using it, this Recogel over five years in Turkey. And I think it's very useful in our daily practice. We all know that the dry eye is a very complex disease. We mentioned it about, and it just makes staining and problems on the cornea and the conjunctiva. So we have the patients, for example, the cataract patients. We did a wonderful surgery, clear cornea, white eye, nothing. But the patients coming to our office every day saying that we have pain, we have itching, we have the for in-body sensation and we have the ocular irritation just because of the, although very short, 2.2 millimeters, these people have the symptoms of uh, dry eye and they, this affects their uh, vision. And we cataract surgeons, what we want, we want the, after the surgery, very good vision and the patients not to complain. So it's decreasing for him by the sensations. It's, we have to treat it very in a short time and just close the sensation of the foreign body sensation from the entrance of the cataract surgery. Why Recogel? It has carbomore and dexpatenol. It's 5%. We know carbomer. This is very important, very short affecting. It has pH of compatible tear time very close. Viscosity is low enough to allow homogeneous distribution of dexpatanol on the gel matrix and high enough to prevent fusion of separate dexpatanol molecules. Osmolarity is very good, a little bit hypotonic, and has very similar properties of the natural tear film. How is it act? Carbomer, as we told before, is bioadhesive, crusting polymers. Dexpatenol is a provitamin B5 and all allows migration and multistraction of corneal epithelial cells. It's in gel form, 
we can use it anytime if the patients have the problems. And this, when we look at the three-dimensional matrix, dexpanthenol and water and the carbomer polymers working together. When we look at the dexpanthenol, it's pantothenic acid. It's provitamin B5 and main component of Q enzyme A, which is essential cofactor for energy production within the cell and also plays a key role in turnover of membrane in the ingredients of the structural proteins and required for normal epithelial functions. This dexpatanol is going to be used over long years in, in dermatology promotes in vivo in vitro growth of fibroblasts, stimulates re-epitalization, reduces erythema, and facilitates healing of damaged skin. And when we look at this using at the ophthalmology and the ocular surface, it allows multi-structional of corneal epithelial cell and helps epithelial healing. Cleaning the wound, coating the lesion of the epithelial cells, and helps the regeneration of the multi-stressed cornea epithelium and just close it in a very short time. How does it make the agents facilitating natural reepitalation? then when we have to use it? First, post-surgical short-term dry eyes, in foreign body injuries, thermal and chemical burns, mechanical traumas, in dry eye, and of course, adjunctive therapy, and in ocular infections adjacent to antibiotics and antifungals or antivirals. There is an is a using of the first aid uh, recogel. There is a work on that, that 50 patients, they just look at, and they just look at these patients, lower than two millimeter deep corneal lesions, removal of the corneal foreign body, then fluorescein staining treatment, antibiotic plus recogel three times a day, and re-examination every 40 hours in these patients. The results are very important. They have a very controlled visit. re epitalization occurs in 85% in 48 hours, in 96 hours complete. And all these patients, when we ask to them, they are the, the patients achieve complete reepitalization. And when we look at the biomicroscopic changes of the cornea, just seeing that reepitalization is a very uh, short time. Also, the subjective resolutions, the eye redness and itching and burning blurry vision symptoms lowered in a very short time by the using of recogen corneal. This patient has very tolerability. Efficiency is about nearly 100% of the re in 96 hours. And when we look at the uh, works and uh, that, if we don't use this patient's discomfort in these foreign body patients, this very short time using Recogel, we gain a very good time and the patient's suffering lowers down. Also, after refractive surgery is very important. I'm doing refractive surgery on if they are PR case. I'm using artificial tears and including nighttime recogel, just just improving the reapitalization. And I think it works very well as well in these patients. When we look at this recogel area of use, this is very important that cataract surgeries, refractive surgeries, ocular traumas are very important. And disorders of the ocular surface epithelium, corneal erasions and the resulting reduces tear film stability. Also it facilitates degeneration and ablocation. Nighttime contact lens wears have very good comfort. Adjunctive therapy for the dry eye syndrome. In terminal and chemical birds, adjunctive therapy, but it helps the regeneration very much. And for in body injuries, it's just, again, closing the epithelium in a very short time. I, I, I think uh, that we are going to talk in the future years about the dry eye too much. I try to just summarize what's going on the DUCE 1 and DUCE 2 in nowadays. 
and two new products which are going to the market. But when we are looking at the treatment of the dry eye, it's completely complex in my opinion. And when we are using the artificial tears, we have to look at nowadays which component they have and how long retain they on the corneas and how does help to lower the symptoms of the patients. Thank you very much again to Bash and Ram. Thank you very much to Lebanese Ophthalmic Society and thank you very much for your listening. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, everyone, for staying. So now we will break for lunch and uh, we will be uh, back at uh, 2.45.